Hello and welcome to Mon County Read Aloud. Today I'm going to test your general knowledge. How many of you know why a bag of Nestle's chocolate chips has a toll house on it? Do you even know what a toll house is? We might know it better by a toll booth. But a toll house and chocolate chips has something to do with our story today. In the book, called Mistakes That Work, 40 Familiar Inventions and How They Came to Be, by Charlotte Foltz Jones, illustrated by John O'Brien, and I think you'll like his illustrations. But let me start by reading the introduction. And it goes like this. Call them accidents, call them mistakes, even serendipity, if the truth were known, we might be amazed by the number of great inventions and discoveries that were accidental, unplanned, and unintentional. The inventors mentioned in this book were not only smart, but also alert. It is easy to fail and then abandon the whole idea. It's more difficult to fail, but then recognize another use for the failure. Much research and documentation has gone into each entry of this book, and some fun, interesting, and sometimes humorous stories about various discoveries emerged. Some of the stories are historic fact, others are legends or lore, stories that cannot be proved and probably can't be disproved. The discoveries related in this book are just the beginning of ideas, though. Research, experimentation, and hard work were needed to develop the subjects into the products we use today. These inventors and discoverers mentioned in this book should teach all of us the lessons stated best by Bertolt Brecht in 1930. Intelligence is not to make no mistakes, but quickly to see how to make them good. And I think John O'Brien does this very well in his illustration. Do you see the gentleman with the flower and the buckets of water? And you know what happens when you put flour and water together. You end up with a sticky, gooey, pasty mess. Maybe that's how paste or glue was invented. I'm going to read three of the mistakes that turned out to work but I won't necessarily tell you what they were at the beginning. I'll leave you guessing. Here's the first one. George Washington never tasted one. Neither did Ben Franklin, Abraham Lincoln, nor Mark Twain. Unfortunately, they, did, they died before this food was even invented. Thanks to Ruth Wakefield, back in 1930, they are now available all over the United States. Wakefield did not plan on inventing a cookie that would become the country's favorite. Now do you know what I'm talking about? Have you guessed it? Well, let me continue. She was busy with chores of running the Toll House Inn, or her hotel, located on the toll road between Boston and New Bedford, Massachusetts. Now we don't have many toll roads still out there, but our closest one might be the one up in Pennsylvania where you have to pay to go on the road. Well, while she was mixing a batch of cookies, Wakefield discovered she was out of baker's chocolate. And as a substitute, she broke some semi-sweetened chocolate into small pieces and added them to the dough. She expected those chocolate bits to melt and the dough to absorb them, producing her chocolate cookies. But when she removed the pan from the oven, Wakefield was surprised. The chocolate had not melted into the dough, and her cookies were not chocolate cookies. Wakefield had accidentally invented the, you're right, the chocolate chip cookie. And they were named Toll House Cookies after Ruth Wakefield's Inn and are the most popular variety in America today. Estimates say 7 billion chocolate chip cookies are consumed each year, and half of the cookies baked in American homes are chocolate chip cookies. These popular treats have even provided full-time jobs. Some vendors sell nothing but chocolate chip cookies, and they even made it to the, poli the political scene. Back in 1980, 
after Canadian diplomats assisted six American hostages to escape from Iran, the American people sent chocolate chip cookies to the Canadian Embassy as our way of saying thanks. So see there? Chocolate chip cookies are famous. And here is John O'Brien's illustration. I wonder if they had to pay double for the road and for the chocolate chip cookies. Okay, that was number one. And number two is not food. It's a toy. And this happened back in the last century. Back in 1943, during World War II, an engineer in the United States Navy was on a new ship's trial run. And as he worked, a torsion spring suddenly fell to the floor. The spring flip-flopped as this ingenious man watched it. So, the naval engineer's name was Richard James, and when he returned home, he remembered the spring and the interesting way it flip-flopped. James and his wife, Betty, put their heads together and perfected a long steel ribbon tightly coiled into a spiral, and they began production of this toy in 1945. Can you guess what it was? If you guessed the slinky, you are exactly right. The walking spring toy. The non-electrical, non-battery required, non-video toy has fascinated three generations of children and adults alike. According to one estimate, more than two million slinkies have been sold. And the only change in the original design has been to crimp the ends as a safety measure. And mine actually has like a band crimp on the end of that, if you can see it. So, the original Slinky. Even though you can find them in all different colors, plastic shapes and sizes, the Slinky is still hopping, skipping, jumping, and bouncing across floors and downstairs all over America. Okay, now to number three. Again, I will skip the beginning two sentences so not to give it away. See if you can guess. A man named Spencer Silver was working in the 3M research laboratories in 1970 trying to find a strong adhesive. Silver developed a new adhesive, but it was even weaker than what 3M already manufactured. It stuck to objects, but could easily be lifted off. It was super weak instead of super strong. Do you know what they came up with? Well, no one knew quite what to do with the stuff at that point, but Silver didn't discard it. Then one Sunday, four years later, another 3M scientist named Arthur Fry was singing in his church's choir. He used markers to keep his place in the hymnal, but they kept falling out of the book. And he thought about Silver's adhesive. So Fry took that, coated his markers, and success! With the weak adhesive, the markers stayed in place, yet lifted off without damaging the pages. 3M began distributing what? Could it be the post-it note? Yes, it was. In 1980, 10 years after Silver developed the super, super weak adhesive, they are now one of the most popular office products available. That's just three examples of experiments that they did from mistakes that now are working and we're using every day. But if you want to find out more about other things in our mistakes that work, you can find out about how Coca-Cola came to be, an ice cream cone, potato chips, popsicles, penicillin, x-rays, frisbees, Velcro, only to name a few. So, I know that it's available online, but hopefully it's in your libraries. But even locally, I found an article about something that happened at WVU about a research project there that had a mishap. 
and created a very new, tough material. And I'll read that article too. Despite scientific theory, lab experiments, and meticulous testing, there is still something to say about good old-fashioned accidents. And it was an accident that led WVU researchers to discover what could become one of the most used materials since aluminum. That material, carbon foam, could turn around the coal industry and possibly produce jobs for the state and beyond. I remember we were in the lab trying to create nuclear grade graphite and this happened. Our project manager said, no, don't do that again, said John Soldoff, the WVU professor of chemical engineering. So we just put it on the shelf and let it sit there. Then six years later, we actually sold it to Touchstone Research Labs out of Wheeling and they worked on upgrading it to production and find new uses to market this carbon foam. The foam itself is a gritty and solid yet lightweight material that's strong enough to stand up to bullets. The foam does not conduct heat or fire. It can withstand heat that would melt steel and ceramic. So they feel that it might be very useful in making vehicle armor, airplane construction, and since it's so lightweight, it can be used as insulation from fire and collision on Navy ships. Brian Joseph, the president of Touchstone, said, we haven't begun to discover all the uses for this. It's just like when aluminum was discovered. Who would have ever thought it would be used for soda cans? So, remember what your parents have said about making mistakes. It's good to learn from your mistakes. And maybe you will even think of a new invention due to a mistake.